Good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me on another episode of the Mind Over Matter Masterclass. And on this evening, I am very excited for the special guest that I have. In honor of Black History Month, and of course with Mental Health Month coming up, I wanted to have the one and only Mrs. Elizabeth Omolami visit me on this evening. And she will be my first guest ever on the Mind Over Matter Masterclass TV show. And so I want you guys to welcome her. As you know, she is the daughter of the legendary one and only Hosea Williams. And we know that Mr. Pastor Williams, how, you know, he has so many titles but he was a great man of God. He was a history maker. And we know he did so many great things for the movement for black people alongside with Martin Luther King. So I want everyone to sit back, enjoy, relax as we have a riveting conversation with Ms. Omolami on this evening. Good evening and how are you? I am doing wonderful. Uh, and I'm honored to be the first on the Mind Over Matter TV show. Uh, it's um, certainly uh, uh, needed. It's certainly uh, something that you're anointed to do. And, you know, so it's just God that blessed me tonight. Yes. Isn't he amazing? You know, yeah. the Lord a few days ago gave me an unction. He said, you have to be bold. I want you to be bold in this season. And God, you know, nobody knows you better than your spiritual father. And mm -hmm. I said, okay, Lord, what am I supposed to be bold about? And he placed it on my heart. I want you, there were two individuals he told me specifically to reach out to. You are the first one. And I was like, huh? She will not respond to me. <laughs> I said, it's no way. And the second person was Miss Andrea Hall. I don't know if you know who she is. She's the first, you know, African American woman that is a fire captain in Georgia. And yeah. she did, she led the Pledge of Allegiance at the inauguration. Mm -hmm. So I'm having you first, and she will be second. And my heart almost can't take it. <laughs> That's so powerful. So I am honored and you know, I want this to be a testament to everyone that's listening. Be bold, be bold. You never know what can happen. You know, the word said, if you knock, he shall open. And I'm so glad I knocked on your door and you opened it for me. So am I, so am I. So to start off this conversation, one of the things I was curious about, and I'm sure this will be a blessing to many of our listeners on this evening, for all the young girls who are looking at you and your accomplishments, can you share at least three nuggets of wisdom or however many you want to mm -hmm. in regards to your passage? You know, a life is a journey. And we know people that have done great things in life, it did not come easy. Any part of your journey will you share that have you have brought you this far that you have learned that you believe you can impart on young girls and young women? Well, again, thank you so much for, for having me, uh, doctor. And I, you know, I have been through many, many trials and many, many successes in my life. As a matter of fact, February 18th is my birthday. Oh, and wow. I was just thinking uh, uh, today, just uh, sort of ruminating over all of the places I have been, the things that I have done, um, uh, just to pick out some things. The first thing I would like to deal with is fear. Uh, I think that fear is holding many people back from being all that they can be. And I think that when Nelson Mandela spoke so prophetically to our community and saying, why are you afraid to be all that you can be? You, you know, the Bible tells us we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Um, 
fear will always be there. It's not going to go away. There is no day or moment that you're going to wake up when you're trying to do something, especially profound and something that you're called to do, where fear is not going to take its place. What you have to learn to do is to act along with the fear. And the fear can turn into excitement. The fear can turn into exhilaration. Uh, you have to realize that being afraid to do something is normal. It's not something that is telling you, oh, you're no good for this. This is not for you. You're not loud enough. You're not old enough. You're too old. All the things that come to us. You're too fat. You're too skinny. You don't have the education. You have too much education. Just on and on. Just do, do it, whatever it is that, that I'm, and, and we use the word unction, and I heard you use that word. Yes. I, I love that word because we do get an unction to do a thing. Yes. And I always say that if I hear it three times, then I believe it's from the Lord. Wow. If you're speaking to me to, to call someone and I say, okay, well, I didn't call them Monday. Oh, and a Tuesday, I told you to call such and such. You got to call. This person will begin to live in your consciousness. Well, that's yes. God talking to you. Yes. And he speaks to us through the fear. So fear is one thing. I want to let everybody know it's always going to be with us. So you must act through the fear and even with the fear. Being Oof. an actress, I can't tell you how many times I've been on stage with my knees shaking underneath my skirt uh, while I was doing a scene with Jamie Foxx or Sandra Bullock or uh, you know uh, uh, many of the wonderful people I've had the opportunity to work with. But as long as the focus can overrule fear, yes, your focus on your intention and what you want. Uh, it's okay to want things. Yes. Sometimes we grow up thinking, well, you know, I shouldn't want to be famous or I shouldn't want to be rich or I shouldn't want, you should want what it is that God has for you. Yes. Um, so, so fear is something. And, and then since we're in the F word, forgiveness, <laughs> uh, forgive, forgiveness, um, I was marching with my father in 1987 and a white church had called his office and said, you know, Hosea Williams, we know that you, you know, were one of Martin Luther King's, you were his chief national organizer and you were very close to him. We want you to come to Cumming, Georgia and lead a march to honor Dr. King. And so we, God began to organize the bus and the lunches and everything we would need. And we got on the bus and uh, it was just one bus at that time. And we went to Forsyth County, Georgia, which is like 10 minutes outside of Atlanta, Lake Lanier. Mm -hmm. And when we got off the exit, we were met with 300 Klansmen in full regalia. Wow. With all white and yeah. a cross on their chest and all of this. And everybody's thinking that Hosea Williams is gonna say, okay, shut the door, turn this bus around. No, he was like, open the door, everybody get off the bus. Because these men and women of the civil rights movement had overcome the fear of death. And they knew when a God, a Kairos moment was occurring, they had the discernment. And he knew that this moment was a moment that God was going to move and be able to cause an a opening of yes. a closed place. So what we found out was that in that county, They'd run all the black people out of that county 75 years ago. And there are many, many places around the country 
where this has happened. And it's in a film called Banished. Banished, okay. Yes, left cigarettes on the table, hot coffee, smoking, dinner on the stove. Packed up all the black people and took them out of the county. And there hadn't been any black residents in that county in 75 years. Well, to make a long story short, we got off the bus and the bus was between us and the Klan's people on this side. Mm -hmm. But between us and the Klan's people on this side, there was nothing. And I remember seeing my dad ducking. My, my son was there. He was hit with a brick. Uh, uh, they were throwing everything at us from feces to urine, you name it. Wow. And the spirit of the Lord came on me. And I'm one of those people that you will never hear say the spirit of the Lord came upon me. Because I just feel like it's overused and sometimes it's some other spirit. Yes. But this day, and I looked into the face, this woman was standing there, the clan's woman in her outfit and she had her little child must have been about four or five years old in a full clan's outfit, standing there with her. Wow. And I looked at her and I said, it, that's how I know it wasn't me. I said, I love you. Wow. And you yeah. could see that hatred just melt away from her like a popsicle in the summertime. Just She just dropped it. Yes. She just looked at me blankly. Yeah. Forgiveness is a gift you give yourself. Yes. It's not for the other person. So that would be my, my second thing would be forgiveness. And I Fair guess and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I guess the third thing would be faith. faith. Oh wow. You know, we don't always have the faith that we need. Even some of the greatest, the Sojourner Truths and the Harriet Tubman's and the Shirley Chisholm's and on and on. Some mornings they woke up not knowing. That's right. You know, and I remember Martin Luther King said, life is like you're going down a ladder into a dark pit and you don't see anything. And you yes. just step down one step at a time. Okay. It's like driving through a dark evening, very foggy, and you can't see, but you know you're just stay on this road. If I'm just going to stay on this road and I'm going to keep driving because I got to get where I'm going. Sometimes that's all the faith you have. That's it. Yes. There's enough faith for the next moment. That's right. No, yes. That's enough. Yes. Because every moment that you step forward, God will meet you in that moment and give you will have the faith for the next moment and the next moment. You might not have faith for next week. You might not even have faith for tomorrow, but you got it for tonight. Yes. You believe that you're going to go to bed and be safe while you're sleeping. Yes. So those those three things, out of out of those things, of course, overriding everything is love. But for me, those have been the three things that I've had to struggle with and been challenged with, and have had to to some degree overcome. Yes, and you know, I know you're not speaking just for yourself. I believe as human beings, we've all had to encounter those three, I don't know if you want to call them characteristics, personalities, spirits, pillars, however people formulate that in their life, how, what, what fear, forgiveness, and faith is, I'm sure we've all encountered it, you know, and we've all either had to stand up to it or run from it or buckle. And so, you know, I definitely take all of what you just said and, and put it in, in my heart because I know for sure I've had, I've come, but so far by overcoming each one of those and still have to, to you yes. know, deal with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And still, because I don't think, you know, you know, 
as long as we still have life, I believe we're going to always re like somehow manage to re-encounter one of those things in our life that is going to challenge mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's necessary so we can mature or elevate no matter what time, you know, period we are in mm -hmm. or whatever age we are at, you know, there's yes. always yes. some kind of forgiveness, some kind of fear or something that, so those are really good. You can write a whole book about those three pillars. Right. Uh, maybe I should. I know I should. Yes. I because should. the story alone that you shared, and it makes me want to go a little uh, deeper in that. Mm -hmm. How How is it that you guys would encounter them? Do you think they knew you guys were going to travel through that, that city? And so it was a planned you know, um, encounter. Yes. yes, because the gentleman that had been working with us, the white guy, really nice guy from that area, uh, had been coming to my father's office for about two weeks, helping us organize this busload of people that were going to take this march on Martin Luther King Day. And when we got off the exit, he was standing at the exit going like this, go back, go back. He's just waving his hands like this. And we were like, oh, hi, there's, you know, Dwayne. He's just like, waving at us, but he, what he was saying. And, and so uh, it turned out that two weeks later, so we were beaten. The bus was destroyed. It barely made it back to Atlanta. But two weeks wow. later, it hit the media. Wow. And uh, 35,000 people came to march in Forsyth County. And it turned out that that was the headquarters of the Klan for the Southeast region. And wow. it was broken open, it was revealed. It is now the hottest, most economically prosperous area in this region, in the coming Georgia Forsyth County, Black mm -hmm. people now live there. Yes. And so the back of the Klan was broken as a result of that sacrificial march that day. It was necessary. Yes. It was not, yeah. As you said, it was a Kairos moment. And, and you know, it's interesting, you know, I love, I love the idea of us coming into a Kairos moment and having the discernment to, to know that's what it is, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, God is so awesome. That's just an amazing testimony. Now here's another question that I want to ask you. And I, I, I think this question came about after reading a particular article about women in leadership. Do you believe from your experience that what, uh, you know, especially um, taking over or stepping up to continue your father's legacy with Hosea Feed the Hungry, now that is called Hosea Helps, that you had to go through some sort of metamorphosis or identity shift and changing as you became a woman in leadership? Wow, that's a great question. Um, and we always think of the butterfly and we always think of the cocoon and the transformation for me was from a young girl who had just done things because her father and mother were doing them. I mean, when I was nine years old, I had already been to jail several times for marching and protesting. Uh, I was sent away to boarding school to go to high school because I had been to jail for protesting so many times in Savannah that they were going to label me as a truant and uh, put me away for a long time. So I ended up at Boggs Academy in Keysville, Georgia uh, in high school. But I, I think the transformation that I've had to make is from a very insecure, dependent young lady that didn't know her power into someone and I'm yet transforming, that God put in places that used me and to own that, to say that that's okay for me to say that out loud. Yes. That God used me in a place. Mm -hmm. uh, we 
my husband and I, and I was blessed enough. That's why I just count my blessings to marry a man and going into our 43rd year of marriage who watched me in this transformation and was not, uh, was not the word is when, when someone is not. Uh, Maybe intimidated. Cause yes, I've heard women say that. Mm -hmm. Was not at all intimidated by me mm -hmm. and what I was becoming. But yes. watching the transformation and I had to own the fact that God was going to put me in these places because he was putting me there whether I liked it or not. So either I owned up to it and prayed and tried to listen and hear what he wanted me to say, or I was going to be standing up there in front of thousands of people looking stupid. Mm. So it's not that he doesn't use you when you don't want to be used. He continues to use you until you realize who you are in him. That's powerful. Yes. And then you own it. Yes. You do a little better every time at being prepared. Uh, and at, you know, who, who would have, let me give you an example. I'm just a kid from Savannah, Georgia. I happen to have a father that worked for Martin Luther King. But me in and of myself, I ended up building a school in the Philippines, uh, uh, going up to, into the rainforest in the Philippines, meeting the Balan tribe there and, yes. and, and bonding with them. And I ended up going to Haiti for nine summers in a row, pulling together doctors and nurses that I brought with me to Haiti who then bonded with the doctors and nurses in Haiti and set up medical clinics for, for the people of Haiti years before the earthquake. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I ended up with a pastor, Woodrow Walker, who was a mission minded man who saw something in my husband and I and trained us how to do international missions I ended up shaking Obama's hand in the White House and looking all around at the White House and how did I even get here? Yes. Nothing in and of myself put me in those situations. I just made myself available and you said, God use me. And I was just blank enough, enough to be able to be used. So that transformation for me is still, is still happening. And then you have that dark night of the soul where you're being transferred, transformed from one situation, one season of your life yes. to another. And you're in the middle and you don't know what you're going to become, but you know you're not what you were. That's right. That's so, right. So you're in that place where you don't even, you don't feel like anything anymore. Yes. Because you're not what you were, and yet you're still becoming what you yes. become. That's when you really have to trust the divine hand on your life. You and know, there's an, there, there's an old saying, and I'm sure you've heard it before, that you're once a man and twice a child. You ever heard that saying? Yes, yes. Yes, yeah. once, once, yeah. once, once a man and, and twice, twice a child. child. Because, you know, the idea is that as you get older in age, you become, you have like childlike tendencies and you may need the help of others and all that, which I get. But as I heard you describe that, what came in my mind is that sometimes it's not a bad thing to almost have like this childlike um, yes. demeanor. And I think that's what the yes. Lord says sometimes in his word, like, you know, because it's something about a child, you're willing to be directed, you're willing to be nurtured, you're willing, you know, to, 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 to take the hand of someone that can lead you and guide you. And so as you were saying that, that is what came to my mind that I don't see anything wrong with, you know, being sort of childlike, because as you're saying, you're no longer that person from um, before, and you're not quite sure 
where I am or at least who I am supposed to become. Does that make sense? Yes, and, and as an actress, mm -hmm. it's interesting because the best actors are the ones that understand the child-like nature of not of trusting not knowing mm. and 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 having been through the training uh to to become an actress you have to empty out yourself to become the character you have to let go of your id your ego to really truly become that other person and so you constantly are going through not knowing. As you build that character, as you write their biography, as you learn about who they are, you're becoming them. And in that becoming, you're losing yourself. Because okay. you have to bring some of yourself to the table, of course, and merge it with the character. But I think that we really have too much attachment. To mm. we, uh, uh, all those attachments to people and to things and to what should have and what your daddy said when you were six and what happened to you. It's not that we're excusing the tragedy in people's lives but you must detach in order to heal. Yes. Because that person's gone about their life. Yes. You know, they're not thinking about what they did to you when you were 12. That's right. But that thing is holding you back. So our ability to sometimes become no one. Yes. And to be comfortable in re releasing. Yes. That that we think makes us who we are is, is very important to growth and transformation. Yes, you know, you, you touched on, there's, oh, there's so much meat in what you just said. In the field of um, psychology and psychiatry, um, there's a school of thought, which is um, the psychodynamic school of, um, you know, it's a discipline, you know, there's interventions that go with psychodynamics. And the idea is that you're going back to the root or the childhood aspects of the individual. And, you know, that's where, you know, Freud, Sigmund Freud and all of that comes in. And, you know, so it's it's really interesting. And, and what you're saying is so true because it's, it's a lot of um, what I encounter in my line of work with a lot of my clients. And a lot of people fear going to the root, going, mm -hmm. let's talk about your childhood. How is your relationship with your mother and your father? Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, when you start going that deep, that is where you're now opening up, you know, areas that have just been covered up or ba a bandage have been placed over those wombs and they were, they have not been healed. All that womb, is it's just sitting there and it's infested with rejection and unforgiveness and a lot of pain and and so now you have an adult who have learned to walk wounded you know mm -hmm. the walking wounded and so it's it, you know i always um say and it's good for all of us to don't be afraid to revisit that those areas and do the work of healing forgiving and moving on yes, you know yes. yeah because it's important but you know that was really good and and um you said this word and i know it's going to stay with me emptying out mm -hmm. you, you know you have to allow yourself to be emptied out that is so good mm -hmm. and um there's so much to take away from that and i know it's really difficult when a person struggles with control to empty yeah. out Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I have had um, this sort of vision. You know, you have a vision of a person standing and just 
dropping the baggage. You know, it's just falling off of them. The weight is just falling off of them. And that is a blessed moment when you can weep hmm. for others and the pain that they're going through is a moment when you've truly forgotten yourself. That's why service to others is so healing. Yes. If it had not been for this organization right here, Hosea Helps, I don't know where I'd be today personally because it, the, through the service to others, in those times that I was really able to truly serve, I was not connected to all that I thought I needed to be who I was. Let me tell you, you're segueing right into my next question. Okay. And so go ahead, because I was going to ask you, how do you take care of yourself in order to manage giving back and managing your stress mm -hmm. and maintaining mental clarity? And look at that. <laughs> yeah. I, I am the worst at taking care of myself. Mm -hmm. I will work myself until I just shut down. Mm -hmm. And then people don't know where I am for three days. Uh, I am uh, mm -hmm. known for being a workaholic. Mm -hmm. My father was a workaholic. And uh, even at the age that I am now, I will go into a space writing a proposal or um or something and just be there for five hours just in that thing yes and, um i want to get better at taking care of myself i thank god for my grandchildren because they are five of them they they give me uh freedom they mm -hmm. give me um uh somewhere to go away from things Good. Because we never, we never, in the civil rights movement, we never took vacations. Mm -hmm. You know, Dr. King didn't have any money. I don't know where people think he got the money from. Mm -hmm. But even when he got the money from the Nobel Peace Prize, he had a wife and five children at home. He didn't give it to them. He took mm -hmm. that money and separated it up and gave mm -hmm. some to SNCC, some to CORE, some to the NAACP, some to SCLC. So not having grown up uh, normal, because I grew up, most of the civil rights leaders and their children suffer with post-traumatic stress syndrome. Mm. They suffer from being, living in fear, not yeah. knowing if the house is gonna be bombed. They suffer from not seeing their parents because their fathers are gone off with Martin Luther King somewhere. They suffer from being shuttled around from school to school and being used to integrate schools. So they never establish those long-term friendships where people say, I knew you since elementary school, you know? Wow. And, and so that, that pain is always with us and is always with me. So yes. I began to look into meditation I began to look into prayer. My, my Christian walk is very important to me, although you wouldn't know it if you asked me how often I read my word. Um, but I started looking at ways to comfort myself yes. uh, and ways to just uh, make myself feel better. And it's a daily struggle. Okay. And thank you for being so open about that because, you know, um, a lot of people, I don't know, I, I believe that it's no longer taboo and the stigma of our mental health care. People are a lot more open and willing to talk about it because of the the tragic things that has, that has happened yes. openly, you know, because of large scale traumatic events that have forced a lot of people to look at mental health, you know, mm -hmm. and how serious it is. When you have a, a, a soldier going on base and killing his colleagues, mm -hmm. 
Mm. That, that's you can't ignore that. Uh. Or you have an in, employee going to work and doing, you know, taking their life and killing others. Those things you can't ignore. I mean, that is the the of course that is the more severe end of it. But for each of us, we all have to um to really weigh the you know the scales of our life. Yes. There are things that we experience in every day. There are things that we inherit. And there's things that happen to us along the way. And so a lot of what you have experienced, you sort of inherited it. You mm -hmm. inherited a lot of it. And some of it became a natural part of your childhood, whether you wanted it or not. You had right. no control over that, you know? Right. And the byproduct of that is, of course, um, you end up developing anxiety and PTSD and separation anxiety and all mm -hmm. these kind of things. Because you remember our soul, our soul is our thoughts, our will, our desires, you know, our emotions. And, and, and those things, they're, they're tangible, they're alive. And it's like sponge. If you put sponge in water, the sponge is going to react. So, mm -hmm. you know, our heart, our emotions, our thoughts, all of those things are affected by all of what's happening around us and to us. Yes. And so there's so much of that you can stop. Some of it you just cannot stop. But when it happens, as you're talking about, mm -hmm. and you come to a place, you have to say, you know what? I've got to do something to take care of me mm -hmm. because we can dress this up. We can dress the right. out, out of core. But the inner self, the inner man, that's where the hard stuff is. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. And you have to figure out what will work for you. That's if right. it's shutting down, shutting down, getting away from, you know, um, work and getting away from the normal things in life, that's, that's what you got to do. You know, sometimes it's, it's for some people, they need at least a good day of rest. There's some people they you know they need laughter you know they yes. need a hug whatever yes. it is yeah so and thank you so why, much you know during covid it's been because with the people that uh, we serve and one of the things that i always said and and i received this organization in 2000 when my father died and my mother passed they both passed in the same year yes mm -hmm. two months apart yes and Next thing I know, people were asking me, are you going to feed the homeless on Thanksgiving? You didn't have a chance. I had no choice. <sighs> I stood outside in front of the hospital where my Piedmont, when my father was passing. And I said, you know, out of my mouth came, yes, we will feed the hungry on Thanksgiving. And my brother was standing there with me and my husband was doing a movie in Africa because he's also an actor and not knowing that there was only $230 in the bank account. Not knowing. Yeah. That, will the volunteers follow me? Because these events that, that Hosea Feed the Hungry is known for, ministering to thousands of people on Thanksgiving, Christmas, now Martin Luther King Day and Easter Sunday. Yes. Uh, and then we do uh, back to school jamboree. And then we do no summer hunger. Uh, it's quite developed now. But at yes. that time in 2000, I, I didn't know what was going to happen. And uh, it was something I had been trained for, though. Yes. You know, I didn't know why my father, it was so frustrating. And I would go across the street every day to the Catholic church. And I would sit that's in that church and just cry. Because first he would put me on the phone, answering the phone. Then he would put me on the mailing. And then the next week he would say, you're with the media. And then the next week he would say, you're back here with the inventory. Count these canned goods with these homeless guys. And then the next day I was back there putting labels on envelopes. And, and it was just, I was like, why are you doing this? But then when he passed, I knew enough to at least be in the office yes. and try to figure out how you start over again. My God. 
also, yeah. for, you know, from the pain. Yeah. Never, never, ever use the pain. That's right. If you're in pain and is, you can't do anything about it. Then you got to sit back and say, you know, I'm going to feel this pain. Now, what is this pain trying to teach me? What, what is it I'm supposed to get out of this? Because you're in it. Yes. Might as well feel it and go through it so you don't have to keep going through it and learn what you're supposed to learn in the midst of that pain. Now, we're in COVID, and I have always said we distributed $2 million in rent assistance since March. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Amazing and I work. Said, I don't want to just be sitting here using my life to write checks to people. Yes. I'm glad that we're preventing homelessness. Yes. I'm glad that we're feeding 51,000 people a year. But yeah. what are we saying to the souls and the hearts of those people so that when they go home, they can make it another day? Yes. Yeah. That is the point. And that is why I was yeah. so excited to meet you. Yeah. And to learn about the work that you are doing. Yes. Because I'm big on education. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I'm pushing myself is, and you said it about writing a proposal over the weekend, I started writing my first grant. I have no idea what I'm doing, but mm -hmm. I said, Lord, I'm going to make this work. I'm going to write all that you put in my heart, all that I know. I'm going to put it on paper and I'm going to submit it and just pray somebody accept it. And so where the rubber meets the road or where I come in with what you're saying is I'm on the other side of it where I want to educate people. I want to help the mentally ill. There's a part where you feed the person, but you know that old saying, there's a point where you got to teach them how to fish. Yes. Yeah. And I understand there are some people that because of how sick they are, they may never really get that full independence, mm -hmm. but there's some in between there that can become independent. Mm -hmm. And so I want to look at how we can do that. Mm -hmm. That's how we can do that it's critical to look yes. at the black community yes. I mean, we don't want to be needy always we don't want to be with a handout always we want to hand up we don't want to yes. but there are people and 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 what is our responsibility as human beings how much value is in the life of a hungry child how much value is there? When you talk about return on investment, well, serve somebody and the return that you will get from that will be healing for you and for yes. your soul. Yes. Feed, find a hungry child and feed them. And I can guarantee you, you'll sleep good that night without yes. the Ambien or your Belsamra. Or Zoloft sleep. or... <laughs> yeah, to yeah. go to sleep. <laughs> so someone else. Yeah. And through service lies the healing for our community. So yeah. not only the people who are being served are receiving, the volunteers are receiving, and everybody is this sort of symbiotic circle that yes. uh, never ends that they will give you back so much more than you could ever give them. You know, so I, I try to express that in as many platforms as I can uh, because we need so much healing today. Yes, we need tremendous healing. And you know, every life has value. You know, I, 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 I stress that every life Every life has value. You know, you have, have you ever encountered someone that you've helped and you didn't think anything about it? You're just doing it from the goodness of your heart. You've helped that person. And somewhere along the line, you come in, you come and you encounter that person again. And they tell, they, they give you the testimony of that day that you helped them and yeah. how much it meant to them and what it did for them. And, you know, every now and then I believe God allows us to have those moments so that it's sort of a affirmation or I don't know if it, I don't want to say validation, but it affirms 
to mm. you that what you're doing is more invaluable than you could ever imagine. Mm. You may think that just feeding somebody, giving them food to eat is common, but it's invaluable because, you know, it's something about feeding a person. It's such an act of love. Mm -hmm. It really is. Yes, it's, you know, mm. it's, and, and it's the only way to be immortal. And that's right. It's yes. the only way to build legacy. Yes. Because everything else will falter and fail. Yes. But that person will never forget how you made them feel. I think Maya yes. Angelo said that. Yes. That they will never forget how you made them feel. And so you live on in them. And you may have to feed the daughter of a Klansman. You may have to serve somebody that did something horrible to some child. You don't know these people that you are feeding, but you have to tell the Lord and depend on divine to say, look, I'm going to feed these people, but I need you to heal them. Yes. I need you to make this bread more than just physical food. That's right. I need you to bring spiritual food yes in the situation yes so that they leave here not hurting others we've had people come and tell us you know this was my last stop i was getting ready to kill myself and i thought i would come on down here and get a sandwich and get a cup of soup or whatever we've had volunteers work at big fortune 500 companies making six figures saying you know if you know, if I hadn't come down here, I don't know what I would have done. Yes, because my whole family, my mother's dead, my father, I had nobody to have Christmas with, and I was just going to self-medicate and put myself to sleep. Yes. So this whole thing of service to others, and you do it every day, you know what I'm saying. Yes, there's a secret in that. There's a secret to good living inside of service to others yes yes i think it's good for our heart it's good for our soul and yes. so i want to be mindful of our time so we've been going for an hour and i think i'll ask you one more question and you know you can um you know share as much as you want um there's so much you you are such a wealth of knowledge and information i'm telling you um oh my goodness you. I'm, I'm going to do something a little different since we just, um, we just celebrated Valentine's Day. What advice you would give um, the single women, married women, anything that you've learned in from your 40 years of marriage? You know, when I say this, young women get mad. Uh, because... Say it. <laughs> Yeah, they don't, they don't like to hear this. There can only be one king in the house. Now, I will say that through a kind of submission, you can do two things. You can build your man up and you can get what you want. There's a secret in there. It, some people say, well, make him think it was his idea. Well, that, that may be part, part of it. But this kind of, well, I'm going to tell him and I'm going to show him. And he ain't going to tell me what to do. And I don't know, I know more than he know. And I, that's not going to get you anywhere. That's not going to cause you to have a lasting, I know when I'm at work, there are times that my husband submits to me because yes. I'm the CEO. Yes. And there are times when he disagree, but when we get home and we lock that front door, he is the king of my house. And why I get not? that, I understand. Why not? Yes. What, what? Yes. What but, does it take away from you to build up the man that's going to be the father for your kids? 
That's he right. should be providing for you financially. He should be providing for you physically. And he should be providing for you spiritually. Yes. If you're going to invest that much in him, then why would you spend your time making him feel like he has no value or you're, he doesn't have as much value as you want him to have? And I tell young women this, there's power in submission. Yes. And, and that word submission, they don't like. They're like, well, I ain't submitting to nobody. I'm like, you need to study my, what I just said. Yes. <clears throat> Wisdom of what I have said to you. It's not taking anything away from you to submit to your man. It's only going to build him up and give you more than you could imagine of what you want in the relationship. Yeah. I, I, you know, I thank you so much for sharing that. I think submission is love. It's an act of love and it's, act, it's an act of wisdom. Of course, it's important to know that you're submitting to the right person. Now, of that's course, right. that's your husband. You made that that's decision, right. you know, because if you submit to the wrong person, we know how that, how that can turn out. Mm -hmm. But submission to me is love and it's really wisdom. It's wise, you know. Uh, who who loves loving a rock, a yeah. hard head, somebody that's difficult? No one loves mm -hmm. a difficult person. Mm -hmm. But when you learn in submission, you sort of, it's like getting on a, on a boat and you know how the boat is rocking. You can't, you learn each other. You learn how, you know, to give or pull back. You, you figure each other out. You know what makes him laugh, you know? You know yes. what gets him excited. Yeah, you know, yes. and you know, and you know exactly how to rub him just right. <laughs> yes, yes. And you know, yeah. I, 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 I am very aware that there are men out here who are manipulative, who will take advantage of a good girl. Yes. And who will, uh, they have this, you know, this, 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 oh, yes, I'm good. Oh, I'm abusive. Oh, but I'm sorry. I'm good. Oh, but I'm abusive. You have to discern and get away from that. Yes. It's unfortunate that we don't have the facilities that we need for women who are being abused to run to. And, yes. and, and that the situation with COVID has many of them trapped. Yes. And they can't make the phone call because they're never alone and they can't get out. Yes. Uh, if I had, was a millionaire or billionaire, I would build houses for these yes. to go to, but I'm talking now, about- see, Now you're tapping into my um, grant. <laughs> All right, well, let me get with you. We can write that together. I'm yes. talking about women who are in healthy relationships, mm -hmm. who have good, and there are good black men. Yes. We hear all these lies all the time. There's no good black men, ain't no good men out there. You keep saying that. Then you're telling the universe, and the universe is like, oh, okay, ain't no good black men. Well, then I guess I won't send you, Harry, that I have been making up for you all your life to be your man. Because you said there's no good black men. Yeah, the, yeah, listen, the, the, spirit, the spirit realm responds. That's yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Right. Yes. So I'm talking to women who have healthy relationships, and it's not easy. Uh, we made a decision to stay together. That's why we are still together. Sometimes you don't feel that love. Yes. It's not a, a, a feeling. Yes. It's a decision. It's a decision. a decision. Yes. And then it helps that we're both in ministry together. Yes. So he's an actor. I know what it's like to be an actor. He's yes. also a minister. We're both licensed ministers. So we understand there's a spiritual journey that we we have to take and that we have to evolve together. Uh, and we also have grandchildren that we're ministering to together. So when we went to Haiti and we to feed people, we went together. We feed people on uh, every week at Jose Feed the Hungry together. Yes. So we are together a lot. And that fortifies what you have. It's such a bond, you yes. know, to Yes, you know, that's amazing. And, and I think 
a lot of young people and some older people have to understand it's love is good to be in love but it's good to know that you've made a decision to love yes. each other yes. to love each yes. other yes. because because we are human and some days we don't feel like loving the person next to us that's right and That's because of that good. decision, decision is going to keep you together. And of course, and you know, I believe the Lord, you know. Yes, you know, but, the spiritual aspect. Yeah, that, yes. And, and when you ask my husband how he stayed married to me for 43 years, he says it was the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he answers that question. We understand, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I want young people to get married. You know, I don't want the uh, a mad, the issue, the... Um, sacrament of marriage to go away yeah uh, i i want them to experience that and i i want it for me too i, yeah. I want it for me i've not yet been married you know yeah. in my you know when i was in my 20s i you know i never took marriage um serious and yeah. i ran away from the opportunity to be married but i'm glad at this point and stage in my life the wisdom and maturity that I've gained over the years. And I think only now I'm open to marriage. Yes, because it should be a whole. Yes. Marriage should be a whole person and a whole person. Yes. Not two half people. That's right. Whole, or yes. one whole person and a half person. So you're looking for that other person that is matured, that is whole, and of himself because you're a dynamic woman and so he can't be insecure because you're always going to be smarter than him and he got to not be worried about that you i know, know? So we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna i don't want him that. to worry about that at all he cannot no. worry about that no we're gonna put that on the altar and lift <laughs> that up to god because uh family mm. we need good black families amen and uh that's uh, also, you know, what I tell young women is that uh, if you're the boss at work, you have to be something else in the bedroom. Come on, come on. You, okay. That is the whole preaching message. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I think I'm going to find a way to snatch you up. And we're going to probably have to do some kind of something, workshop or something on this. Yes. Because yes. you are a wealth of knowledge. Thank and so you. I have kept you um, for over an hour. And I appreciate all of what you have imparted. Is there anything that you believe that you wanted to share we have not touched? On? No, no, okay. I don't think so. I think okay. we covered it. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm emptying you out. <laughs> yeah. I can With... toy with that tonight. Uh, having, and I appreciate you allowing me to give as much as I've given and listen as well as, as you've listened, because listening yeah. is an art. It is. Yeah. It is. A lot of people listen to respond instead of listening to understand. Wow. That's and I've had to do that. You know, I, I said to the Lord, why, why would I become a therapist? Because uh, people that um, struggle with anxiety, they also struggle with listening. And I, and I realized I was an anxious child. And I'm not sure where the anxiety came from, but I had to deal with that. So in order for me to become a better listener. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. good. I yes. don't remember that. That's excellent. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I say right. God yes. bless you. Yes. Pronounce your name for me. Diane John Baptiste. Yes, Diane yes. John Baptiste. Yes. Is that, yes. Is that a, a New Orleans name or a French name or what? Well, it's it's actually from the Caribbean, the West Indies. My parents are both from Dominica, West Indies. Mm -hmm. And so in Dominica, the first language is the French Creole Patois. Yes. So they speak that in English second. So, but I was born and raised in St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. Oh, that's my favorite place in the world. Yes, that's, that's my favorite place to go. And I yes. used to go uh, at least once a year. And uh, I lost, uh, I, I lost my unction or something happened and I would, uh, but I would go right there at the hotel right on the beach in St. Thomas. 
such a that's beautiful home. place. Yes, that's home. That's actually where all of my family is. My mom and my two younger brothers. I'm the only, um, you know, free bird. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. you have an amazing home to go to. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I need to visit very soon. So, yes. so Let me thank know. you I'm so nice much. You jump in your suitcase. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, well, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Please stay in touch. I will, I will. And um, let me stop recording. Let's see here. Stop and stop recording. You will receive an email when it's ready. Okay.